for people who may not be familiar with the legislation, what is Medicare for all? Yeah, Medicare for all is also known as single payer health care. And I want to explain what payer means. Payer is the one who care, pay, pays for health care when it's done. You think about it, right? You pay a health insurance company as it stands. And then if you were to go to a hospital or a doctor, they pay. That's why they're called a payer. So right now you have multiple payers, a whole bunch of health insurance companies that compete for each other for primacy in a particular market. Um, you pay one of them or your employer pays one of them. Uh, and then ostensibly they pay for your health care, but usually they fight you for it. Uh, and figure out how to make sure that they keep that money that you paid for your healthcare. So instead of multiple payers, you would have one payer, and that would be the federal government. So the federal government becomes your insurer, no matter who you are. You're young, you're old, you're employed, you're not employed, you're married, you're not married, you're over 26, you're under 26, doesn't make a difference. The government is there for you. It's your employer. And because the government doesn't have an incentive to make money off of you, they don't have an incentive to charge you on the back end, this deductible or this copay. They're not interested in negotiating a set of rates that figure out how to consolidate the market because they are the only payer in town. There's a term that everybody understands, which is monopoly, right? A monopoly is when you're the only seller of a good, right? And when you're the only seller of a good, people have to pay the, pay the price that you're asking because you're the only one. What, what, what Medicare for all does would turn the government into the, op is the, the contrapositive of a, a monopoly, which is called a monopsony. A monopsony is the only buyer of a good, right? They're the only one paying, right? Single payer. And uh, as the only one paying, they get to dictate the price. And so they can bring down the prices for the cost of healthcare for everybody. Everybody's included because everybody's covered. There are no none of these co-pays or deductibles that, uh, that at this point are attributable for about 67% of all bankruptcies in this country. Uh, and um, we are providing a set of services uh, that is consistent for you regardless of your life circumstances. It is a comprehensive solution to so many of our healthcare problems, whether it's the cost of healthcare overall, the unexpected out-of-pocket costs, the consolidation that is raising the prices, the fact that, um, that too, too many folks are uninsured, all of those problems they get their solution in Medicare for all. And I'm gonna give you one more solution that I think is so important, particularly as we contend with uh, COVID for like the 18th month, which is the fact that in this country, we don't invest in prevention. There's no incentive to do it, right? Because if you're a health insurer, even if you were to invest a dollar today to prevent the disease tomorrow, the high probability is somebody's gonna be on another insurer. So you're not saving yourself money, you're saving them money and ultimately Medicare money, which if you're a corporation, you're not interested in doing. Whereas in Medicare for all, right, you have the government is in invested in both caring for you if you get sick, but also preventing your illness in the first place. And so there's a lot more opportunity for investment in public health, which we were so lacking uh, right now. And I think those kinds of investments uh, are going to be critical to building a healthier uh, and certainly a more equitable America. And as you say, in terms of incentives, the government is more incentivized to keep the prices low because it is a political uh, calculation for them, as opposed to what we see with these health insurance companies attempting to extract every dollar from you. And I think prevention is a, is a really important point um, because there is, as you say, in for-profit insurance, a, a very perverse incentive to I'm not going to say keep people sick, but not necessarily stand in the way in terms of uh, incidents happening. I guess, you know, maybe expand upon that if you could. Yeah, most of what makes people healthy isn't stuff that we do in the clinic or the hospital. It's stuff we do outside the clinic or the hospital. And no one health insurance has, the company has the capacity to make sure that, for example, your streets are safe or that your air is clean and pure or that, uh, that the water that you drink um, isn't going to poison you vis-a-vis uh, -vis lead in Flint. Um, those kinds of investments are investments that have nothing to do with health care. They have everything to do with public health. Those are also the kind of investments that the government has to make and government should have an incentive to do. And when the government on the back end is responsible for caring for you, if you get sick, then it also has an incentive to prevent you from getting sick in the first place. And right now what's happened is because healthcare is so freaking expensive, we're talking about 20% nearly of every dollar spent in our entire economy spent on healthcare, there is not that much money invested in keeping people healthy in the first place. And if you were to align those incentives via a program like Medicare for All, uh, it changes very much the things that we do outside the clinic to keep you from getting in the clinic in the first place. And frankly, it maps to our, our interests, right? I mean, Emma, if I were to tell you, look, uh, I have five MRIs I can sell you, right, for, five, for $500, would you buy them? 
you probably would say no, right? Because I don't need an MRI. But, right, let's say you were playing basketball tomorrow, right? And you felt a pop in your knee. And I'm like, okay, Emma, I've got one MRI for $5,000. Would you buy it? You, you probably would, because that's the key to figuring out uh, if, if what you need to do to, to get healthy again. And the point that I'm making here is all of us would rather invest in staying healthy than invest in getting health care after we get sick. We don't want to get sick in the first place. But, our healthcare system is designed to sell us healthcare after we get sick. There's no incentive really to keep us from getting sick. Um, and so that doesn't really align with what we actually want. Yes, all of us want healthcare if we get sick, but we'd rather not get sick in the first place. Um, and uh, Medicare for all allows us to make those investments to keep us from getting sick in the first place. Yeah, I, I, I like the assumption that I would be the one getting uh, my knee blown out because I guess your crossover is just that good. But, you know, we'll, we'll return <laughs> to that at another point. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the political realities of this of this. I mean, we've talked about the immense amount of money on the other side, but we're a lot farther away than I think a lot of people might understand. Um, we have a president who has explicitly said he would veto Medicare for all if it came to his desk. Uh, he said that during the, the primary or uh, or at least the election at some point, at least half, if not more, of the Democratic Party is opposed to a single payer system. And now the 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 position is so popular um that they like to use the language of medicare for all infamously people the judge during the primary as i say not to relitigate that but it's just a good um example he came out for medicare for all who want it talk about how that's just not viable because there's only one path forward and that is for as you say the monopsony model the single payer model um and the attempts at incrementalism around this seem uh, like, honestly, they would sap the larger goal um, it, it, when trying to go for for Medicare for all. Well, what a lot of um, politicians are trying to do at this point is to um, to 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 work around the millions of dollars that have been spent to inculcate people with a set of talking points that are intended to scare them off of the actual solution. And so what you'll hear when you raise Medicare for all is like, well, people love their choice. Well, actually, I don't think anybody really likes the choice of what health insurer they get, which bureaucracy do I want to have to work through and which plan do I want to have to choose that has some amount of premium and some amount of deductible. People don't care about that. People want to know who their doctor is going to be and that they're going to have a choice there. Um, they also tell us that Medicare for all is going to cost too much, except for the fact it's going to cost us substantially less as individuals in the world. Um, these are all talking points that a lot of money has been invested behind. And rather than take them on, uh, like Senator Sanders and, and, and even Senator Warren did, um, they would rather skirt around them. And I just think that we have to spend a lot, of, a lot more time taking them on. It's one of the reasons that we wrote the book because they're just not true. Those talking points are flawed and they're designed to fear monger. And I think when you actually sit down with folks and say, all right, let's talk dollars and cents about how much you spend on healthcare now and how much you'd spend on a Medicare for all and the product that you get, it's obvious that Medicare for all is a better deal. And so, yes, we uh, are, are under right now an administration that does not support Medicare for all, and we're not gonna get Medicare for all under President Biden. That being said, I do believe that what we do under President Biden is going to decide if and when we do get Medicare for all in the future, because this is the time for organizing. This is the time for folks who believe in this to get together, to continue to do the hard work of talking to people in their neighborhoods and uh, at work and in their families about uh, the challenges that our healthcare system has and the solutions that are available if we're willing to have the courage uh, and the, the 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 foresight to take them on. Um, and I think we also have to name names about the, the powers that these corporations have had to lobby our politicians, to influence our uh, public debate in ways uh, that accrue only to their benefit and, and only to our loss. Um, and so I, I believe deeply that this is a possible thing and it is a probable thing. I think we're gonna see it in my lifetime. But I also know that politics isn't linear, right? And so if you're looking at a straight line moving into a certain direction, that's just not how political change happens. And, you know, we talk about Medicare in our book and the fight for Medicare and how many times the fight for Medicare failed until it finally succeeded. And so what we've got to be doing is building the groundwork for Medicare for all, even if that's not going to happen uh, in the next two or three years. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, I think that's so key. And also why the earlier conversation about the history of how long the struggle in this country, how it began in the early 20th century, we were talking about this shot down, shot down, shot down, shot down multiple times along the way in decades long increments um, to just kind of say, talk about the activism surrounding big um big agenda items like this that would be so immensely powerful and and structurally uh, structural overhaul um it just goes to show that that you have to have a long-term uh perspective as well as short-term goals and short-term goals include organizing in the way that you talk about so um one i think one of the bigger obstacles is we need more union support to push behind and of course national nurses they're incredible but there needs to be a bit more i think uh pressure that is uh targeted and simple and on the ground that includes other unions so i, I guess maybe talk a little bit, bit about what that pressure looks like what that organizing looks like um and how we can have that long-term perspective while also fighting like hell in the short term yeah well you know a, a lot of um the the pushback i hear from uh from union leaders and i'm a proud union member uh, of the A-A-F-T and aft and seiu um a lot of the pushback I hear is that, you know, we spend so much time and effort bargaining these contracts that we don't want to walk away from them. And I understand that. And I hear that. And I guess the long term view that I, I always take is imagine you didn't have to bargain for healthcare in the first place. Think about how much time and effort you did spend on healthcare. What would it look like to bargain for more than just healthcare? to bargain uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the major uh, concessions that you got? for things like time off or uh, things like wages. And um, I think over time, that conversation is starting to really take root. The other point here is, uh, unfortunately, um, for, for all of us, but you know, it, it does accrue uh, to the benefit of Medicare for All and the movement for Medicare for All, is that these healthcare corporations have gotten more and more greedy. And the amount of money that they're making and the amount of money that they're extracting from us is going up and up. And I think people are starting to look at their own circumstances and they are just sick and tired of having to pay for something that's just not there for them when they need it. And um, that includes union members and non-union members. And I think as this continues to happen, people are going to start to see, unfortunately, the futility of continuing to rely on a private health insurance system, thinking that it's actually going to be there for them. Uh, if and when they get sick. And I um, I hope that uh, that we will continue to to be there talking about the, the opportunity that we have through Medicare for All and the challenges that we have through our current system um, and demonstrating why our approach could be better. The last point I'll make is this. I wrote a previous book called Healing Politics. And in the book, um, my central thesis is that we as a country are struggling through an epidemic of insecurity. And the problem with insecurity is that uh, it, it, it encourages an attitude uh, of zero sum that says that the world cannot actually be better, that it, it really can only get worse. And um, because we are so, uh, I, I would say, victimized by the past 40 years uh, of Reaganism and a system that has sold off public goods for private benefit, um, that anybody who tells you that the system can be better, you instinctively mistrust. And so I think we have a responsibility to call out the system and explain why Medicare for all uh, actually can take on the brokenness in the system um, and solve a lot of the problems that we're all experiencing in our day to day lives with our health care. Right. Lastly, really quickly, uh, before I let you go, what organizations would you would you direct our viewers to in terms of joining uh, and fighting for Medicare for all? Yeah, there are some really great ones out there. Obviously, you mentioned the National Nurses United. They have been a bulwark for Medicare for All. Uh, if you're for my physician colleagues, the Physicians for National Health Insurance Program, uh, PNHP, are fantastic. I'd encourage people to get involved with Be a Hero uh, or Public Citizen or Social Security Works um, who are doing amazing work. Uh, there are a, a, a number of organizations um, at the local level. Uh, you know, in Michigan, we have Michigan for Single Payer that's been doing some great work uh, on this front. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I would say get involved, um, with one of these organizations that they, they ha are constantly having amazing, uh, opportunities, CPD, another one, people's action is another one, but even if, it, if, if you don't feel like you can give, you know, time dedicated to a particular organization, I always say that it's better to have a thousand people talking to one person each than one person talking to a thousand people. And the relationship that you built with the people that you know and love um, 
use that as an opportunity to organize, right? That micro organizing really matters. Um, so make it a point to say, look, you know, whenever this healthcare conversation comes up, I'm just going to talk about why I think we could be doing better and Medicare for all really is the answer. And if enough people are doing that, it's going to have a big, big difference. So yes, please get involved with one of these amazing organizations doing amazing work. But even if you can't, even if you don't, you don't have the time, um, just make it a point to be a micro organizer in your own life. Absolutely. Dr. Abdul Al-Sayed, uh, Medicare for All of Citizens Guide is the book. Thank you so much for your time today. Emma, thank you so much for a great conversation. Folks, there's more of what you've just saw where that came from. That's if you hit the subscribe and like button. Thank you. Really, thank you.